Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the EGU General Assembly and to our second press conference today. Uh, I would like to remind everyone here that we will open the floor for questions from the journalists in the room following presentations by all of the speakers. Our press conference today is on the latest research on plastic pollution, and taking part in it, we have Roberto Sergio Azzoni, who is a professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of Milan in Italy. Stefan Krause, who is a professor of eco-hydrology and biochemistry at the School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences, University of Birmingham in the UK. Alethea Mouthford, who is a PhD student on Earth, uh, in the Earth, Ocean and Planetary Sciences Group at the School of Natural and Environmental Sciences, Newcastle University in the UK. And finally, we have Eric Van Sebil, who is an associate professor in oceanography and climate change at the Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Research, Department of Physics, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And I'll now hand over to our speakers. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Roberto Sergiozzoni, and thank you for inviting me to the press conference. I want to present to you the results uh, of uh, our work that we have conducted on the apps, and in particular, the first evidence of microplastic contamination in, in one of these uh, um, glaciers. This work was, has been conducted uh, by researchers from the Re Environmental Science and Policy Department of the University of Milan in collaboration with uh, researchers from the uh, um, University of Milano Bicocca, both in Milan. Well, let's move to the presentation. Uh, we know <laughs> very well that uh, the accumulation of plastic is uh, one of the most widespread and uh, long-lasting change of uh, uh, to the earth's surface that uh, human activities have uh, produced since uh, the 50s when the, uh, mass, when the plastic production starts. Uh, plastic is persistent, is, uh, accumulates in environments and uh, can enter the topic change. So the problems in uh, the ecosystem is, uh, have already been demonstrated and are imp impressive. So uh, plastics fragments have been found uh, almost everywhere in deep sea, in the whole of the world, uh, also in subalpine lakes. But uh, uh, no study have documented the presence of plastics on mountain glacier, in particular on alpine, on alpine glacier. Um, the presence of plastics on glacier is not a big surprise because uh, plastics are everywhere, and so why not on glaciers? Um, on glaciers, in particular on Fronny Glacier, that is uh, our study area, we, we found a strong human contamination that coming from uh, um, a locked nose origin from the near Po Plain, where there is um, a lot of uh, um, polluted uh, pollution emission. On this glacier, we have found we have already found uh, particulate uh, uh, and pesticides uh, and. Um, many persistent organic pollutants. So uh, why not plastics? And uh, in particular, why not plastics? Because uh, uh, this glacier is highly uh, frequented by hikers. And uh, when you go to a glacier, everything that you wear is uh, made by plastics. Everything technical uh, equipment is made up by plastics. So uh, we are... Um, we are going to find and characterize this kind of contamination on this glacier, where uh, on Forni Glacier, that is one of the largest Italian glaciers, and one of the most beautiful <laughs> Italian glaciers, is located in the central Italian Alps, and is not so far from the um, Po Plain, so the, one of the more uh, polluted areas of, of Italy and also of Europe. Um, the challenge of sampling microplastics on glacier is uh, uh, avoiding contamination during the sample because uh, the technical uh, equipment when uh, that you wear on glacier are completely made of plastic so if you want if you don't want to contaminate it uh, you must wear uh, cotton clothes and uh, wooden clocks get that uh, for the super, for the <laughs> glacier um, area is not so um, comfortable and in particular, it's not so comfortable changing between <laughs> a technical wear to a um, plastic-free wear. Anyway, uh, on Glacier, we have found we have focused on the two um, on the superglacial debris, both uh, sparse the superglacial debris and both from cryoconite. Cryoconite, uh, cryoconite ores 
uh, are small ponds that uh, are present on glacier, filled with fine sediment and uh, and water that are a hot spot of biodiversity on glacier. Um, after the sampling, we extract uh, this microplastic to a density separation, and we describe uh, describe um, and classify what we have found. And yes, we found plastics. We found a lot of plastics, and uh, we found that there is a um, high uh, uh, concentration of plastic in the subglacial debris. Uh, we estimate about 75 items of plastics per kilogram of superglacial debris. That is very much if is uh, uh, in the range of variability of plastic contamination observed in marine and coastal sediments. So glaciers are not so immaculate as many people think. Uh, about uh, the characteristics of these items, we found uh, more fibers than fragments. Fibers are in particular uh, have a local origin coming from the wear, the, wear of, uh, the clothes of, uh, of uh, mountaineers, of, hiking, of hikers, and so on. Fragments have uh, both a local and a lochtonous origin. The, 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 um, this origin was, has been characterized from, the, uh, from this kind of analysis, from the composition analysis. Uh, we found that uh, many, uh, the, many con the many characteristic uh, of uh, plastics are made by um, polyester, and uh, but we also found uh, uh, from uh, microscope analysis that then uh, that uh, some uh, small pieces of uh, of microplastics can be uh, correlated to an aeolian transport. So that um, plastic that come from uh, the polluted area of Poplain or so on. We try to estimate a rough estimation of uh, uh, microplastic items of foreign glacier based on the quantification of superglacial debris. And uh, we can uh, stress that on foreign glacier uh, there are uh, more than uh, 100 million of microplastic items. So it's a huge uh, contamination for a glacier that is. Uh, uh, um, immaculate area as a phony glacier. Well, this is a, a first and a preliminary study. We found it in some samples and we want to perform further analysis for deeper acknowledgement about uh, the interaction with uh, mi microplastics and, uh, um, and microbial uh, and organisms that uh, live on, uh, on glacier. And we found so that uh, that microplastics have uh, a local origin, but also um, there are small uh, wind-blown fragments that come in from, uh, from the cities of the plains. And uh, it's very interesting uh, finding uh, these um, microplastics on glaciers because uh, glaciers are considered as a, to have a potential for long-term persistence of contaminants because the snow falls on glacier and remain here for years. So uh, we can uh, stress that uh, um, glacier can be a sort of uh, accumulation area of uh, microplastic, uh, of my microplastic. And um, these microplastics, obviously, in, our, in the, the climate change um, scenarios, have uh, started to release in the environment, in the Down Valley environment. So uh, this was the first preliminary study. We opened uh, a door of microplastic contamination on Glacier, and we want uh, um, to deep these analysis in the next years. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Stefan Krause. I'm from the University of Birmingham, and uh, I'm presenting uh, results of a team of, of researchers that are focusing in particular on the sources of plastic that end up in the ocean. So a project that uh, we launched uh, very recently, which uh, is called the 100 Plastic Rivers Project. And I specifically uh, want to highlight the work of uh, two of the senior postdocs that have uh, contributed to this uh, uh, work. That's uh, uh, Dr. Holly Nell and, and, and uh, Dr. Jen Drummond. There has been uh, 
a history of research on, on microplastics, in particular plastics, uh, micro and microplastics in the oceans and at coastal zones. And only more recently, in the last four, five, six years, we are starting to see more research that is looking into what the actual sources of that plastic particles are that are accumulating in the oceans, where they are coming from. Uh, how they are transported from the land uh, uh, into the oceans and uh, what the space-time dynamics of their arrival in the oceans are. So we are, in, in, in our group in Birmingham, specifically focusing on plastics that are entering our river systems and how the properties of that plastic particles, their physical properties, uh, like their buoyancy, their shape, etc., uh, uh, how they are controlling where these uh, particles are accumulate in stream bed sediments, for instance, in vegetation, uh, and how they are potentially breaking down into smaller particles down to the nanoscale, and how they are reaching and when they are reaching and what state they are reaching the ocean. So we are specifically focusing on what's called the aging of microplastics as well. So it's when microplastics in a biological medium like a river are accreting biofilm. And that accretion of biofilm that is settling on the plastics is uh, affecting how that plastic, how the physical properties of that plastics and with that how they are uh, either floating on the surface or how they are staying in suspension or how they uh, might settle uh, uh, at the sediment interface. Uh, and can also have a substantial impact on the, the biogeochemical uh, uh, fate of microplastics, how they are basically breaking down their capacity to sorb contaminants and uh, their capacity to break down and leach uh, additives that are uh, 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 part of them, like uh, plasticizers, including bisphenol A and neurophenol, which are endocrine disrupting substances that mess about with our uh, hormone system and, and we are quite concerned about. And we are starting uh, uh, to look into how these particles, in particular at the interface between river sediments and the rivers, uh, how they are taken up in aquatic food webs, considering that these uh, uh, aquatic food webs are, of course, the bottom of, uh, of that food chain there, where, where we are standing at the end. And there has been a, a lot of uh, evidence on looking into sequences of, of that uh, uh, more complex food webs that plastics can be taken up. Uh, we don't really understand very well yet what constraints are they are taking up, why they might be actually preferentially being taken up, in particular by biofilm grazers and uh, how there's a pathway of the contaminants that are either sorbed through the particles or that are entailed in the particles or fibers, how they can end up in, in uh, 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 biota and how they might biomagnify on their pathway along the food web until potentially they are taken up by us. We did uh, uh, a range of uh, local studies uh, uh, and uh, found in particular that uh, microplastic concentrations in the local river that we worked on, that's the River Tame on the top here, uh, as well as in the sediment of that river was much more controlled by the flow velocity in that stream uh, than any exposure to uh, the outfalls of uh, wastewater treatment plants that are considered sources or have been identified as sources in, in, in many areas or uh, the population density or the uh, 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 vicinity to, to sealed surfaces like a road network, for instance. So it gave us understanding that, that, of course, we need to understand how hydrodynamic conditions, flow velocity, for instance, is uh, controlling the transport as well as the accumulation of that particles in stream bed sediments. Uh, based on the fact that we find lots of uh, low density plastics in stream bed sediments so that are hinting that there must be transport mechanisms uh, that are actively transporting microplastics into the sediment so it's not just a density separation of heavy particles sinking down but also uh, light particles being transported into these environments. But what we found more striking was when we compared our results to other uh, results of microplastics. Uh, these are all results from sediments that you're seeing here and uh, you see uh, uh, we, we found uh, a bit less than 20 particles per hundred gram uh, of sediment, which is roughly similar to what colleagues uh, that worked on the Thames a couple of years uh, ago found, but which is uh, more than an order of magnitude less with other colleagues that are uh, working 200 kilometers uh, uh, north of us in Manchester found. And you see, if you look into more global uh, uh, range, there's a wide variability of concentrations found in the sediments, and we think a lot of uh, 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 that is due to the fact that uh, 
we don't really have any unified sampling protocols that are followed. People are sampling for microplastics both in rivers as well as in sediments in very different ways. And there's no good or bad method, it's just different methods. And that really uh, is, is a big challenge for any intercomparability of that few studies that, that have reported data so far. So that led us to proposing or well, developing a, a method that is uh, Handable enough that we can propose it uh, to be used in uh, in a wider context in uh, countries that are uh, more capable have, have uh, uh, tech technological analytical facilities uh, uh, where, where it's relatively easy to apply, but also in, uh, that it can be applied in, in more low middle income country uh, contexts. And uh, this uh, contains sampling of uh, surface waters. Uh, through a, 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 a mesh that, that we uh, designed for this and sampling of sediments that are uh, uh, done in the Hunter Plastic River project has been launched uh, two months ago and uh, uh, we have sent out a bit more than uh, 50 sampling kits so far to a, a wide range of, of countries around the globe. Uh, we have received the first samples back. The first one we received back came from Terra del Fuego, so it's uh, probably as far away as it gets from where we analyze it. Uh, and uh, people uh, are really, it's a great uh, uh, contribution by the whole community. Uh, they are sampling and extracting sediments, they are sampling surface water and locations where we know about the flow conditions as well. This is sent back uh, uh, to us in, in, in Birmingham where we are then analyzing uh, the plastic content in that uh, uh, samples. And it's methods that we're not just sending out and, and see what's going to happen. We actually beta tested that uh, method uh, Last year, together with uh, Charity, the Clean Seas Odyssey, that we're going in, a, in an old sailing boat along the English Channel, both the British as well as uh, Normandy and Brittany side in France, and working with communities, uh, uh, coastal communities, uh, in a citizen science approach, taking people out to the river mouths in order to sample plastics from stream bed sediments uh, right where the river hits the sea. and. Uh, uh, one of the big advantages there is that the picture we are getting integrates the whole catchment signature. So it's uh, representative for whatever comes down the river from the entire catchment, not just the location where we decide to sample. And what we saw there was uh, a broad variability in uh, both uh, size distributions of, of, of microplastics, as well as what different types of plastics we're having. And, and we were quite surprised that uh, we found uh, more fragments and, uh, than, than fibers. Often people found more fibers than fragments. We use a staining method that is relatively uh, uh, new in, in, in this community, uh, uh, has been uh, published only a couple of times before, and that really enhances the recovery rate of uh, the particles. So we are quite hopeful uh, uh, to be able to deal with this uh, large number of uh, samples that are coming back now from uh, the global community with uh, microplastics. What do we do with that samples? On the one hand side, we want uh, uh, to get a baseline. We want to know what distribution of plastics do we encounter globally and what's the, the difference between uh, primary plastics that were designed as microplastics, like microbeads, or more secondary microplastics that are the results of uh, and breakdown products of, of microplastics. But we also can use that data and modeling uh, uh, approaches uh, like, like done by Jen Drummond in my group uh, that, that uses that data to calculate what are actual accumulation rates in stream bed sediments. So you've done that with all the so far published data, of course. This map that you're seeing here, the global map, is as we speak, speak being populated with more and more data as we are getting this data in it. They make us understand which river systems are accumulating how much plastics in sediments, and that defines to what degree this emerging pollutant uh, is, is, is causing more and more of a legacy uh, of pollution in river sediments as well that will uh, slightly to still bleed out the, the river catchments even if we would be able to stop plastic inputs into the environments. Thank you. Hello. Um I'm Alethea Mountford, uh, I'm based at Newcastle University, um, and I'm going to be talking to you about modelling the three-dimensional distribution of plastics uh, in the global ocean. This is work that I'm doing with my PhD supervisor, uh, Dr. Miguel morales Makeda. Uh, so a little bit of background briefly. Um, we don't have a definite estimate of how much plastic is getting into the global oceans every year, but it's thought to be around 8 million tonnes. Um, 
and this has been going on since uh, plastics were commercially produced back in the 1950s, so we would expect uh, really vast quantities to be present in the, in the global ocean at the moment. Uh, but current model um, outputs suggest that the total amount of floating plastics is only around 250,000 tonnes. So there's a big disparity between the amount that we've put into the oceans and the amount that we're actually uh, possibly being able to see there. So the question we're asking is, where is that plastic? Um, so the key points for you briefly, um, we're running a three-dimensional model, uh, which is called NEMO. Um, and we include uh, positively buoyant, which are floating plastics, and negatively buoyant uh, or sinking plastics. Um, in this positively buoyant, negatively buoyant model, um, we also did separate simulations where we included a sedimentation rate, um, where plastics basically reach the seafloor and then are taken into the sediment, but uh, I don't really have time to speak about that now. Uh, we also did a separate simulation where we focused on neutrally buoyant plastics, so these are essentially passive, uh, passive traces. Um, and we did this experiment uh, because as plastics break down and fragment into micro and nanoplastics, and also for primary micro and nanoplastics, they tend towards a neutral buoyancy because of their small size. Uh, so the outputs of our model show that plastics are essentially present at all depths in the ocean. So for the positively buoyant plastics, they're present within the top sort of 100 or 120 meters, so right near the sea surface. Um, for the negatively buoyant plastics, there are peaks uh, near the sea surface, again, uh, around 100 to 200 metres. This is where the plastics are settling in the coastal areas, in the coastal shallow areas. But we also see peaks as well in the deep ocean, so around sort of 3,500 or 4,500 metres, where these are settling on the deeper abyssal plains uh, and in the deep ocean. And for the neutrally buoyant plastics, uh, they're present to depths of around 2,500 to 3,000 metres. So these uh, neutrally buoyant plastics are able to be drawn down to deeper depths than, say, the positively buoyant ones, um, because they are more at the mercy of the ocean currents, and they can be drawn down by processes like turbulent mixing. Um, so for the positively buoyant plastics, um, the plot on your left is um, the vertical integral um, of the global ocean. So essentially, if you flatten down the entire water column onto a 2D plane, um, and saw all of the plastics that were, the, were within the ocean. Um, that's what you're seeing. Uh, and in the simplest of terms, you're seeing um, the areas where the concentrations of plastics are above average. So in the darker red areas, um, it's about 100 times more concentrated than the average uh, um, global concentration. And in the darker blue areas, uh, about 100 times less concentrated. So we can see that there are accumulations in the five garbage patches in the North Pacific, uh, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and Indian Oceans. The North Pacific being the most pronounced with the most uh, concentrated um, amount of plastic there with concentrations around 100 times more than the average. Um, but aside from that, we can see areas of accumulation in Southeast Asia, which is thought to be the largest producer of mismanaged plastic waste um, or basically the highest producer of marine plastic pollution. Um, and as well in the Mediterranean, uh, particularly towards the eastern end, um, and which is a semi-enclosed sea, so essentially any plastic that goes in there, it's very difficult for it to get out again. Uh, but what we were particularly interested in was um, a small accumulation off the west coast of Africa uh, in the area of the Gulf of Guinea. So you've got the Guinea current and the Angola current, uh, which form a cyclonic gyre and essentially trap all the plastic there. Uh, we don't have all that much um, observational data from that region, uh, so we can't say for sure whether this accumulation actually exists or not, but uh, the model suggests that it may be there. Um, and on the right-hand side, you've got the vertical profile of the um, positively buoyant plastics. Um, so there you can see here that they're reaching depths um, of around 100 to 120 metres. Uh, I forgot to point out as well that the... Um, distribution plot that's a log scale so um, yeah basically yeah 100 times more concentrated um, so for the negatively buoyant plastics um, as I said there's uh, accumulations in the more shallow areas so particularly around Southeast Asia and areas like that and also um, in some regions of the uh, of the European seas so the Baltic Sea and North Sea which are relatively shallow um, but the plastics are actually being transported um, by deeper bottom cur currents away from the coastlines, which you can see quite clearly 
uh, in the Indian Ocean where uh, the colour sort of goes from a pinkish to a greyish. Um, so these plastics are being transported into quite remote, deep regions. Um, and with the inclusion of our sedimentation rate, we saw that there was massive amounts of removal into the sediments in these regions. So deep ocean sediments and really remote areas are possibly quite a large sink for these negatively buoyant plastics, um, which you can see in the vertical profile plot. So there are, you can see the really, really quite large peaks um, in the deep ocean, which drop off with the sedimentation rate. Um, and as for the neutrally buoyant plastics, um, there aren't really any particularly noticeable trends apart from um, quite a wide ranging uh, accumulation in the North Pacific and also in the Indian Ocean, um, and also really large concentrations in Southeast Asia and the Mediterranean again. But the thing that's most noticeable with the neutrally buoyant plastics is that they're reaching quite a lot further away than with the positively buoyant and negatively buoyant plastics. So they're just being spread out um, over the global ocean um, and even towards the Southern Ocean as well. Um, so I've also been doing some work sampling for plastics in Drake Passage. So in the um, region between the sort of tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula, um, where I've been sampling for plastics at all depths um, to see whether there are plastics being um, transported possibly into the Antarctic continent by deep water transport. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that with anyone later. Um, so for the vertical profile, um, as I said before, you can see that the plastics are being drawn down to almost 3,000 metres um, just because they're really at the will of the ocean currents um, and they're just being taken down uh, through turbulent mixing, uh, wind-driven mixing, processes like that, and they're just really permeating deep into the water column. Uh, so yeah, to conclude, um, modelling suggests that plastics are present at all depths, and we can use three-dimensional modelling to um, sort of look for potential hotspots for plastics of all densities, whether this is at the sea surface, um, in the water column, on the sea floor, or even in the sediments as well. Um, so thank you to uh, Newcastle and NERC for funding me, and thanks to Eric who gave me the data so I could do this work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and last then, um, I'm Eric van Sebeel, I'm at uh, Utrecht University, and I'm here to talk more about the uh, plastic at the surface of our oceans, and what we know about it and what we don't know about it. So. A few years ago, I, um, I led a, a big study that came out and that got quite a bit of attention, where essentially we, 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 we calculated that uh, the total amount of small floating plastic that we know about at the surface of our ocean right now, that that is something like 50 trillion particles weighing almost 250,000 metric tons, what Alethea also said. And that's a problem, that number. The first time that I actually calculated, I was shocked because it is far too small. It is much, much smaller, indeed, as LRT also said, than the amount of plastic that's going in to the ocean. If you would do a simple budget analysis of the plastic going into the ocean versus this number about how much plastic is actually at the surface of the ocean right now, then you get to something like this. More than 5 million tons enters every year. Sometimes you hear 8 million tons, sometimes you hear 10 million tons, but it's, 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 it's a large number. And compare that to less than 250,000 tons floating at the surface of the ocean. A bit of math would get you to that every year at least 20 times more plastic enters the ocean than is floating at the surface of the ocean right now. And that's going on year after year after year. So I would say that we really only know of 1% of all the plastic in our ocean, we know where it actually is. The other 99%, we have no idea where it is. We don't know if it's on the ocean floor, we don't know if it's on coastlines, we don't know if it's in um, marine animals already, we don't know if it's been fragmented so small that we can't actually observe it anymore. That's beyond the, uh, the, our technological sorry, uh, beyond what we, can, what we can measure with the technologies that we have right now. 
So this is essentially the basis of a, a big project that I'm leading. Um, it started two years ago. It's called Tracking of Plastics in Our Seas. It's uh, an ERC starting grant proposal. And what we want to do is to create a model where we actually track individual pieces of plastic in a global simulation of the ocean. So essentially we're making a virtual plastic simulator. We're virtually polluting the ocean uh, because it does less harm than actually doing it in real life. Um, and with those pieces of plastic, the, the virtual pieces of plastic, we want to incorporate fragmentation, we want to incorporate biofouling, we incorporate beaching, we incorporate the sinking, all of the processes that we think are important for understanding how plastic moves around in the ocean. Now we're working very hard on that, and there was a poster um, yesterday by one of my PhD students who actually did this for the Mediterranean, and is now starting to get to grips about implementing this framework for, um, for the Mediterranean. But that's not completely crystallized out. So what I want to focus here in, in, in a few minutes is this is some work that's just been published a few weeks ago about the role of waves. So oceanographers like me, we always think about ocean currents. And waves is for surfers and not important, right? Um, that turns out not to be entirely true. And the story starts in Antarctica. Um, Antarctica, as you may have seen in, in Alethea's plots also, uh, the Southern Ocean is very low in plastic densities. All the models that we have predict that it's almost impossible for plastic to end up near Antarctica. And the reason for that is that the flow at the surface of the ocean, at least, is away from Antarctica. It's called Ekman upwelling and Ekman divergence, Ekman drift northward. So the flow at the surface is northward, and therefore it's very, it's, 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 it's very difficult for plastic, we think, to end up in Antarctica. Except for, we find a lot of plastic around Antarctica. There's been a few studies now, um, one from a Japanese group in 2017, one actually that I was involving, involved in also by the Brazilian group on the, on the, on the lower left here, um, where, uh, where we found a lot of plastic in the, in the Antarctic Peninsula. And a large overview study by the, 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 the British Antarctic Survey here on the right, where there were loads of observations of plastics around Antarctica. And of course, the first um, thing that you think about then is, well, the scientists that work there are just really not very good at keeping their, their, their trash with them, right? They're, 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 they're the litter box, maybe, or maybe the tourists are. But maybe it's something else. Maybe it's actually the ocean that does uh, move a lot of plastic southward to Antarctica. And the story doesn't actually start with plastic. The story starts with a thing called kelp. So kelp is um, big algae growing uh, on the ocean, and it doesn't grow on Antarctica. And there was a biologist a few years ago who found it on Antarctic Peninsula. So he was walking along a beach, and there all the way on the left, I don't think I have a mouse, no, no, sorry. Uh, all the way on the left, you see a piece of kelp that he found on, uh, on, on the beach there, and realized that that is very special because it doesn't grow there, so it must have drifted. Now, because it is kelp, unlike, um, say, plastic, um, we were able to genetically identify where it came from, right? And we could identify that this particular piece of kelp came from a colony either in South Georgia or in the Kerguelen. So it must have drifted almost 20,000 kilometers all the way around Antarctica from either South Georgia or the Kerguelen towards Antarctica. And most importantly, it must have drifted against the mean flow. The question is then, why is that? And that is why when I and my team also got involved, because we wanted to simulate this. We wanted to simulate this drifting of the kelp, as we, we, we think it's like the, the, the drift of plastic. And the really surprising thing is that we were able to only get the drift right when we included the currents and the eddies, and also a thing called Stokes Drift, which is essentially the waves. I'll come back to that. But what you see here on the, on, on the right side, that big, that big map, is all the particles that we started in, uh, in South Georgia, all the virtual pieces of kelp. And the blue ones are the ones that end up around Antarctica, and the red ones are the ones that don't end up around Antarctica. So some, indeed, ended up around Antarctica. If we, uh, the two other panels, on, the, on panel A, we didn't add that wave effect, and none of the particles actually ended up in Antarctica. In panel B, we didn't add the eddies, and also none 
of the, uh, of, the, of the particles ended up in Antarctica. So what we showed is that it's really important to have the, the eddy field, the, the chaotic ocean currents, as well as the Stokes drift. Now, what is Stokes drift? It's, as I said, it's, it's, it's something that oceanographers have not very often considered. That was for surfers. But it's essentially the, the net effect that a particle takes because it goes faster with the wave at the crest than it goes against the wave in the trough. So you see, I'll play it again, that these, the, uh, the, the particles at the surface of the ocean, they don't make perfect circles, but they actually make these ellipses. So with every single wave, the particle moves a little bit along with the wave. And we've now shown that this is super important for tracking, uh, for, for the transport of floating stuff. The problem is that we don't actually measure it. There's no way to measure uh, Stokes drift from, say, satellites. We can measure all we want from the ocean except for Stokes drift. And that is yet. Because ESA, um, the European Space Agency, is actually now planning a mission, the Sea Surface Kinematic Multiscale Monitoring Mission, SKIM for short, um, which, which purpose is to actually measure the Stokes drift directly. So this is um, one of two Earth Explorer concepts missions, and I'm on the, on the mission advisory group of SKIM, where we actually want to, um, to start this, this uh, um, if the satellite gets launched and the decision is going to make in July, then we actually, um, then we actually, yeah, then, then from the first time we will actually be able to measure Stokes drift directly from space and actually be able to understand how this moves uh, plastic around. Because it matters, if you simulate it, we see indeed that particles that move with the Stokes drift, a lot of them end up indeed around Antarctica. But they also end up in very, very narrow lines. And when, when I showed this at a, at a meeting a few, uh, a few weeks ago, somebody said that especially that line in the South Pacific, it's not in the garbage patch, but it is this narrow line. And she said that she, mo she sailed through this line and did see a lot of plastic there. So it is something to explore further what this effect of, of uh, Stokes drift is. Now, finally then, um, this is also important if you want to think about the risks of plastic, because so far we've all only spoken about the occurrence of plastic. <laughs> but of course it's not just about where the plastic is. If we want to understand the effect of plastic in our, in our, in our environment, then we need to understand how it interacts with marine life. And most of the marine life in the ocean doesn't live in the garbage patches. Most of it lives, for instance, in the Southern Ocean. So we did a, a study already a few years ago where we looked for sea, where we investigated for seabirds where they actually are at most risk of, inter, of interacting with plastic, of, of picking up plastic. And that's this map here, where you see in yellow hardly any species of seabird uh, are at risk of interacting with plastic, all the way to dark red being a lot of uh, species that interact with plastic. And you see that indeed it's the hotspots in the Southern Ocean where most of the seabirds pick up the plastic. That's simply because that's where most of the seabirds live. So we really need to start understanding how plastic moves around in the Southern Ocean because that's where it impacts most life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions. Does anyone have any questions? You do. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jonathan uh, from the BBC, Jonathan Amos. Uh, Eric, how do you measure this drift from orbit? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's a um, so the the, the the PI has called it. It's a it's a police radar gun on a disco ball flying around in space. <laughs> so it's radar, um, and and you may know about altimetry, about uh, about radars pointing down and measuring sea surface height. Now, what we're going to do in SKIM is we're not going to point exactly down, or, well, we're also go 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 going to point exactly down and then we have a normal radar, but we also have a few radar beams that are in an angle. And because they are at an angle, if the water moves away or towards the, the platform, then you get a Doppler shift. And with that Doppler shift, we can actually measure the, the direction in which the water moves directly. And because it is rotating around and flying at the same time, we get it at all different angles, that Doppler shift towards or away from the, from the platform. And by that, we can make a, a full vector of how the currents move. Now, then we need to separate out the waves, the currents, and everything. But we think we can do that. And, and we are now, at this moment, actually 
um, putting the final hand at the report that says, uh, the report for mission selection that says, we can make this satellite, we can fly it, and let's, let's just do it. And then, um, and this goes to Alethea as well, uh, and, and your talk, um, yes, how, it's Tuesday, isn't it now? It feels like it's <laughs> several days. Uh, but your talk yesterday uh, Ro gave the suggestion that perhaps some of the plastic arriving in Antarctica is not coming on the surface, but is coming at depth. So I wonder if the two of you could, could talk about that. Yeah, so um, it's a good question, and I'll start. I, I think it's a matter of size. So I think um, what we... I normally, in my presentation, I don't like to talk about the sizes of plastic because I think that um, plastic comes in a whole range of sizes, right? And as a physicist, I'm, it's a spectrum. So why talk about nanoplastic, microplastic, mesoplastic, et cetera, right? That, that, that just, just constrains you. But of course, it is true that larger objects have more buoyancy, so they stay more at the surface, whereas smaller objects, and especially the nanoplastics that you hear about so much now, they are much easier to get mixed down deeper. And then, once they get deep, then they could also get much easier towards Antarctica because the ocean circulation is essentially... Um, I have a plot for this, if you want. Um, the ocean circulation. And this is a very famous uh, plot of how the ocean... So Antarctica is here on the left, and it goes, it, at depth, it goes towards Antarctica, and then it kind of like, once it's near the surface, so the black arrows, and then it goes north, so this Ekman drift. So let's say 300, 400 meters deep or so, or, or a few, few thousand meters deep, there the water actually comes up. So if the plastic is deep enough, then it can actually travel to Antarctica. But that's really only possible for plastic that's almost colloidal. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't take size into account with my modelling uh, work either. Basically, I just have a, a concentration of plastics, and they're just they're not even particles, it's just a concentration. Uh, but the reason why we did the um, simulation with the neutrally buoyant plastics is exactly for the reason that Eric said. Um, the micro and nanoplastics uh, are much easier to be drawn down by turbulent mixing, other processes like that. Um, so in the model, um, as you, with the outputs, as you saw before, um, these neutrally buoyant plastics are draw being drawn down to about sort of 2,500, 3,000 meters. Um, and there, it's very possible that they could be taken into these currents that are going uh, towards Antarctica and the deep ocean and being drawn back up at the once they reach the continent. Um, and the work that I've been doing in Drake Passage as well, um, we've been able to see that there are plastics present at all depths in the water column that I'm, I've been sampling. Um, and these plastics are really, really tiny, um, microscopically tiny, um, which suggests that, yes, small, small plastics can sink, either sink down or be uh, transported from further away um, into at least the Antarctic region and into the Southern Ocean. Um, and we're seeing more plastics at depth than at the surface um, in the sampling work that I've been doing. It's all very preliminary at the moment, but that's the sort of pattern that we've been seeing. This is Eric Stockstead from Science Magazine. Stefan, in your citizen science project, mm -hmm. it looks like you're getting samples from more developed countries. And I wonder if, are th how much are you missing by not having poorer countries where there might be less recycling or more plastic entering the ocean. So how, are you going to be able to get those, and how much of the picture are you missing? Yeah, I, I, I think we actually it's the opposite. We get currently more samples from uh, uh, low- and middle-income countries uh, uh, from both communities over there as well as from, uh, let's see, re teams of researchers from more developed countries working in low- and middle-income countries which is two different sources and you need to treat samples maybe slightly different as well. But uh, we are very keen to in particular get uh, samples from wet areas as well because the waste stream separation, et cetera, is very different to highly regulated countries. And uh, for that reason, we uh, hypothesize that the range of uh, secondary plastics is significantly higher than, than, than areas as, as, as in Europe and uh, uh, the Western world, if you, if you want to call it like that. And uh, I've, I think uh, we, we, we've just uh, started to send out uh, uh, sampling equipment uh, into several Southeast Asian countries, India, I mean, China uh, uh, is, is, is 
making great progress in, in how they separate waste streams. Uh, so I don't know where you want to see it in, in, in between, but uh, uh, I think we will get a quite uh, a balanced picture of uh, uh, plastics in that are, that are in streams and stream bed sediments in low and middle income countries. And given also, yet you've seen publications in the last two or three years that were uh, claiming that, that it's a couple of 10 uh, uh, Southeast Asian streams that are the main source of the plastics that we find in the Pacific. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical how much evidence, we, it's very likely the evidence for that is, is, is rather thin and I hope we can provide more evidence for A, where uh, uh, in a particular out of what systems the plastics are coming, but also how much we accumulate in stream bed sediments. And that's, uh, I mean, that's linking to, to something that, that, that Eric said and, and uh, uh, that I would add to the graph he had there, to the, to the scheme. I mean, when we are missing a lot of plastics in the ocean, so I think there's a high risk that a lot of that is actually uh, in stream bed sediments, so it's still coming out of the system for, we don't know, for decades, centuries after we stop putting them in, if we stop putting them in. Uh, hi, it's uh, Adam Bourne uh, from New Scientist, uh, Roberto. I just wanted to ask you uh, a few questions on your um, on your paper. Um, is, is, as far as you're aware, is this the first on any terrestrial glacier anywhere that has been actually sampled? And uh, does this particular glacier feed sources of drinking water and what therefore might it mean for human health and in terms of what can be done presumably either hikers all have to wear wooden clogs or we ban hikers from those glaciers i mean what if anything can be done yes uh, this uh, work uh, uh, is the first one on until uh, yesterday i think is <laughs> uh, the first one uh, conducted on uh, on a terrestrial glacier on a pine glacier and uh, it's a preliminary work because uh, many um, many ideas uh, about the, the the development of of this work is uh, is on the table, so we can do it. And uh, <coughs> about um, Forni Glacier is uh, connected with uh, uh, energy production on uh, in the Down Valley area and not directly on um, agricultural or something like that but uh, uh, we don't uh, analyze this content in the um, in water in uh, melting water the content of microplastic but we have analyzed uh, uh, the content of other contaminants that I cited in the um, melting water and uh, um, there is a dispersion because uh, yes in the cryochronite there is a concentration of um, plastics and uh, concentration of other contaminants but uh, in the runoff uh, uh, of um, of melting water there is a dispersion of contaminants and moreover microplastics in here are sampled in sediments not in melting water so uh, another topic uh, should be analyzed the, the melting water down valley but i think that uh, the concentration will be too uh, low for for any kind of analysis because um, during the summer the, the ablation uh, r um, streams that uh, come out uh, of the glacier are very impressive so there is a sort of dispersion and what about the production of uh, uh, of clothes I, I don't know what uh, uh, we can do uh, we can suggest because I know that some uh, little um, industries uh, are starting to product uh, uh, ecological uh, um, uh, wear, uh, clothes, but uh, uh, I think that I don't know uh, what uh, I suggest to, to this because uh, I think that uh, the plastic pollution relation to, related to the clothes uh, is a problem not only in Glacier but on only. On Antarctica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Antarctica. Yeah. I, I, I'm actually, in New Zealanders are thinking of going back to wool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I read something on uh, um, the dispersion of microplastic in washing machine from washing machine, and yeah. but uh, uh, on I think that uh, the, the this glacier was uh, a curiosity. This glacier was located in a um, first world war uh, area, where the, during the first world war there were uh, many. Uh, fighting between Italian and Austrian and uh, you may in some cases you can find also corpse and uh, 
in that case, all the, the clothes are completely made by wood, <laughs> by wool uh, or, uh, or, or other uh, natural material. Um, so I, when I found one of these, uh, I think about it that we must uh, return to this kind of, uh, of clothes. Of, uh, but um, I think that it's not possible in, in the near, in the next uh, decades, it's impossible. So I think that the problem of the uh, plastic contamination also on glacier can be a sort of uh, uh, way to uh, sensibilize people because uh, uh, also in glacier, from Marianne Trench to glacier, we found microplastics. So it's microplastics are everywhere. And we can use this these, uh, research and the other research presented uh, for sensibilize uh, people about this theme. Sorry, you mean make people aware? Sorry? Sensibilize, you mean make people aware, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. James Dacey, Physics World. Uh, this question for Eric. So at the end of your talk, you talked about the identifying the regions where marine wildlife is most likely to come into contact with the plastics. Has there been much research into the types of plastic and the concentrations that would be most dangerous to, those, to that wildlife? That's a very good question. Um, there... In my mind, so I'm not an ecotoxologist, right? So I'm now speaking as somebody who, who's very close to the field and who, who interacts with, with a lot of them. But I think we have a huge knowledge gap about what really are the impacts of the plastic. Yeah. Um, and the problem a bit is that all the studies done so far, or almost all of the studies done so far in, on, on the, the harm of plastic are essentially biologists buying themselves large aquaria, putting a species in there and just starting to add my, uh, plastic. And at some point, that species, that oyster or whatever, will die. And then what you've got is you've got yourself a dose response curve. So you know at which concentration plastic is actually lethal, that it will actually kill an animal. And that's been done a lot. And it was a, a good paper, I think, with Boxall and Burns and Boxall or so. It was a, a, few, a few months ago out uh, from the UK. And they analyzed all these, these, these experiments and looked at the concentrations at which that happens, where animals actually just acutely die, and compared those concentrations to what those animals actually experience in a real ocean, and found that for almost all of them, it's at least a million times smaller. So for almost all species, we know that the concentrations are a million times lower than what would be completely lethal to them. Now, that kind of makes sense, because if it wouldn't be, then there would be no life in the ocean anymore. Um, but still, if, if that's our, our, our knowledge base at the moment, if that's kind of like the state of the art, we know that animals are not just dying off in, in large amounts, we don't really know much more. We don't know where we are on the more, um, the more chronic um, effects. We don't know where we are on the, on, the, on, the, on the intergenerational effects. So I would say that we know much, we, we know less about, or no, we, we, we know little about how the plastic moves around the ocean, where the plastic is, but we know even less about where and how it actually does harm. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Liz Callagher, also Physics World. Um, can you say where the missing plastic is proportionally? Do you have any feeling? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we could all just guess. Yeah, speculation. <laughs> my, my, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, so, so most, most of my colleagues, I think, would say that's on the seafloor. Um, and that makes sense because it, there's a lot of seafloor. Now, it depends a little bit on what exactly you call seafloor. I mean, when the seafloor starts and when it's just a coastline. But my gut feeling would be that actually most of it is on the coastline. That um, most of it, either, it, it either never leaves the river or if it does leave the river, then the next storm just pushes it back onto a coastline somewhere. And it, it gets buried in the sand. Uh, but that's... We're working very hard on actually quantifying that and 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 um, and and improving it. But that's kind of the working hypothesis that at least I'm working with. I don't know if you have other. 
Um, I would say that definitely in the coastlines, uh, there must be absolutely extortionate amounts of plastic. Um, but for the microplastics that can be transfer transported further away from the coastlines, I think that um, deep sea sediments um, or just the deep sea floor definitely would be a really substantial sink for them. Because uh, if they could be transported away from the coastline, they've got to sink at some point. Uh, especially if they're being biofouled by small organisms that would then affect their density. And if they're already um, sort of neutrally buoyant, then any sort of addition to their density will just help them to sink down. Um, if they're being eaten by small organisms, they can then be incorporated into their fecal pellets, which will then transport them down to the seafloor. Um, so I think definitely the seafloor or the sediments would be the, the largest place, yeah. Yeah, I would maybe be less optimistic that we're able to, to say where, where the missing Gap is, uh, and I really think we make a big mistake by excluding in that analysis, largely so far, terrestrial and aquatic systems. If you think, I mean, we all know how littered beaches can be by macro and microplastics, and uh, we know what the surface area of a beach is and how much that might vary in tidal zones, etc. But we also know what the surface area of rivers and riverbanks are, river floodplains, and we know how littered they are. That's something we have hardly taken into account so far. And we're only starting to think about all the plastics we put into a very long storage zone, which are our soils. And uh, we do use biosolids out of uh, wastewater treatment plants that retain a lot of plastics, at least in, in, in regulated uh, countries, which is good. So we, they are not going out to the rivers, but we use that uh, biosolids as fertilizer in many, in many areas. And uh, that, of course, is then in a system where it takes even longer until it reaches the ocean. And uh, we haven't really attempted to make any global budgets for that yet. I think we, we need to urgently. Uh, and we are only starting uh, to see the vast amounts of, of all different types of uh, uh, plastics, low density, high density, so positively or negatively buoyant plastics in stream bed sediments at concentrations that often exceed what we see in, in marine sediments. Of course, there's much more surface area for marine sediments. So uh, I think we are still quite a bit away from really uh, uh, attributing where that missing link is, but I, I would strongly advocate that, that we need to take uh, not just coastal, but really terrestrial and aquatic systems into account there. We only have time for one more question. Hi, um, it's Vivian Cumming, I'm freelance. Um, I was just wondering about the changing nature of climate and ocean currents and particularly how that affects circumpolar deep water and if you're taking that into account in your models. Um, no, not yet. So, so, so we're really now thinking about what the ocean circulation is at the moment. Um, and trying to understand how that moves plastic around. Um, that's not entirely true. Well, yeah, so for, for the Southern Ocean, that, that we just take it as it is. We are also doing some work on the Arctic. And there I am interested in how the, uh, the transport of plastic between the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean would change if, uh, with the changing Arctic. Um, but that's really, that's just begun. That's some, something uh, that we're exploring. Cool, thanks. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to finish here, but if there are any remaining questions, you're welcome to book one of the interview rooms we have available. Um, we'll finish here, and I'll thank our speakers very much. Thank you, thank you all thank for you attending. Much. And our next press conference is on mon monitoring the Earth from space, and it starts at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.